Hello and welcome back. Uh, in this segment, I'm going to discuss the uh, a few formulas that we use for stress distributions in a number of interesting design applications. And what I will discuss is application in uh, the design of uh, flywheels, uh, rotating rings, uh, uh, turbine blades that uh, can uh, also move at uh, very high speed. So in all of these applications, we have an inertial force that tries to pull the ring apart away from a shaft. And that, this is similar to applying a, a pressure, but the pressure is outward and it, cause a, uh, it will cause a stress distribution that can actually tear apart uh, this rotating uh, ring. Uh, the second uh, type of design application that I'm going to discuss uh, is the uh, stress uh, distribution that uh, develops uh, in uh, a curved beam. And uh, curved beams are very useful because they carry uh, thrust in them and they're also used in uh, cranes and other uh, machinery uh, that, uh, in which we have uh, a moment and an axial force uh, on, on that curved beam. And uh, the third uh, type of application, design application, that I will discuss today uh, is an application where we have uh, two cylinders. One of the cylinders is the outside, the outside radius of the inner cylinder is somewhat larger than the inside radius of the outer cylinder. And then we would cool them down usually so that we can fit them together and then raise the temperature. Then that will allow for some expansion. And uh, the, uh, then we would have what's called as an interference fit or a press fit that the inside is pressed in, uh, against the outside. Again, at that interface between the two cylinders, we have uh, pressure, and the pressure is acting to compress the inner cylinder and is acting to expand the outer cylinder. So in all of these design applications, the interest is in developing some formulas. We're not going to derive them, but we will uh, discuss how they use and then take a couple of examples. So this is uh, the subject uh, today that uh, we are discussing and uh, we will discuss uh, rotating rings. So in this application, we would have a ring like this, like uh, let's say a flywheel, and uh, the flywheel would be attached to a shaft, and the shaft is uh, uh, used to transmit, um, to transmit power, and uh, it is rotating at uh, an angular frequency of omega. So in this case, we will be interested in uh, finding out what happens when you have these inertial forces that uh, tend to uh, uh, tear this uh, ring apart. So this is application one. Application two is uh, press fit. And in this case, we would have one cylinder and uh, uh, the cylinder has an inside radius and the inside radius is uh, kind of smaller than the outside radius of a second cylinder. So we press the second cylinder onto the uh, first one and uh, what you can see here is that I have a delta which is called the interference which is uh, a displacement that has to be accommodated when you have uh, the inside cylinder uh, to be inserted into the outside cylinder. So this is the press fit, which is application number two. Application number three is a curved beam. And the example of a curved beam would be, let's say, a crane. And the crane has a hook and the hook, uh, we would have a force, and the force is acting down here, and uh, uh, it's causing a bending moment here on the shaft of the, of the crane, and it's causing stresses uh, at different locations of that uh, 
crane uh, hook uh, that would lead to distribution of stresses. And we will look at this as if we're looking at bending of a beam, but the beam now has a curved cross section. So let me look first at the types of stresses that develop when we have a rotating ring. So in this case, the rotating ring uh, will have uh, a stress distribution. Let me just find it for you here. That uh, looks like this. It looks like the, uh, we have two types of uh, stresses. We have a tangential stress component and we have a radial stress component and uh, the tangential uh, stress component and the radial, they uh, uh, both act to, uh, uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the elements. So me, if I can uh, have this illustrated here by saying that if I have, for example, the uh, rotating ring, if I separate it here and uh, I get an element and the element here in this ring will have a stress component that is in this direction. So this direction here is um, the tangential direction. So this is sigma t. And then it will have also a stress component in the radial direction that is sigma r. So these are the two different stresses that would develop in the rotating ring and the ring is rotating about the axis here with a frequency omega so in this case we have the inertia force sigma uh, rho is the density of the material uh, times omega square and you get a factor that has a Poisson's ratio and then the dependence on the radii is given in this form it is r squared so what we know is rho omega squared is uh, the inertial mass and then you get uh, an r squared term but it is uh, ratioed by the inner radius square plus outer radius square plus a uh, common factor r i squared r o squared over over r squared so you have the dependence on the distance from the center is one over r squared here minus uh, constant times r squared so it is kind of a complex dependence. So uh, we would expect to have a peak of this tangential stress somewhere between the inner and the outer radius. The radial stress also has the same types of dependence, one over r squared here and minus r squared. So we would have to evaluate uh, these. And then if you look at um, the uh, situation here for the radii, so the radii, we have uh, an inner radius and an outer radius uh, that's given by Ri, and uh, the outer radius is Ro. And hence, we can calculate the stress distributions, as you can see in here. So the next uh, design application is the, the application for the press fit. And uh, the press fit, we have the inner radius of the cylinder is Ri. The interface is at a radius capital R, and the outer radius is at Ro. And then delta is the, the, the amount of uh, displacement that needs to be accommodated, and this is called the interference. So it's the difference between uh, the two radii, the inner and outer, before they become one unit. Because after you push them together, you get one common radius r. But before, uh, the inner radius was r plus a little bit, and the outer radius was r minus a little bit. But when you push them together, uh, then you get uh, a common radius r. So the pressure that develops at the interface is uh, delta over r. So this is like you can think about it as a strain. And uh, the strain, when it's multiplied by an elastic modulus, which is 1 over E0, like you can imagine E0 is up on top, same thing here, E out, and this is E in, uh, then you will get a stress, and the stress is like a pressure. So in terms of units, the pressure is the same units as the stress. So basically, you have delta over R. This is the strain uh, that develops, and the uh, 
these two different uh, fractions here that are uh, included, uh, they uh, give us uh, the amplification of that uh, strain. So I have R out square plus uh, common radius square over R out square minus the common radius square. And this nu is the Poisson's ratio for the outer cylinder. Nu I is the Poisson's ratio for the inner cylinder. If the two cylinders of the same material, then the elastic modulus EI is equal to EO is equal to E. And we get a simpler expression uh, for the pressure that develops. Once the pressure develops, then we can think of the problem as if we have um, uh, two cylinders. So we will think about it uh, as if we have uh, the two cylinders and the two cylinders, one has internal pressure that's pushing it out and the other one has external pressure that is pushing it in. And that's what we have here. Uh, so you can see that uh, we could use the two equations we developed before for the tangential and the radial stress of a thick pressure vessel uh, in the general sense. And um, if we have for the inner member, if it happens with the inner member, uh, then the outside pressure is P and the inside pressure is zero because we don't have anything inside. It's just the pressure is at the interface between the two cylinders. So the tangential stress uh, evaluated at the interface is minus P times capital R squared plus RI squared divided by capital R squared minus RI squared. And for the outer member, <coughs> we have the outer pressure is zero and the inner pressure is the P at the interface. So you get the tangential stress at the interface is, as you can see here, is P times RO squared plus R squared divided by RO squared minus R squared. And thus we have all the tools now to design that system. So next uh, issue that I would like to discuss is the design of curved beams in bending. So the curved beams in bending, uh, they are useful and they can be used for a variety of applications. And um, for example, uh, I have an experiment in, in our lab here at UCLA and this experiment we have uh, an arch made of aluminum and then the arch is loaded and then we measure the strain distribution and the stress distribution is obtained by conversion of the strain to stress via the elastic moduli. So the configuration of the arch for the, uh, my experiment here is like what you see. So simply support it. And these are the positions of the strain gauges and we push on the top here to cause the arch to deflect. So when we do that uh, and we take any section, then we see that the reaction on both ends is P over two. And then if any section, we would have a normal force and a shear force and also a bending moment. So the bending moment is exists on this uh, side here. So there's another moment here. So basically you have a system of forces on the Cross section normal is P over two sine theta. Shear is P over two cosine theta. Moment is P over two times capital L minus lowercase l, which is R sine theta. So now the question is that having these three types of forces on the cross section, what is the stress distribution? Can we uh, compute it? So what we'll do is we will now kind of uh, uh, develop uh, a couple of equations for the stress distribution in an arch. So if we assume that we have a neutral axis here that uh, doesn't change in length and that this arch is under a pure moment and it has a cross section as you can see here, then the fiber, if you have a fiber that is uh, say at some location or distance away uh, from the neutral axis, this distance is y, for example, then this fiber is going to, uh, if I apply a moment, the fiber is going to stretch 
and the amount of stretching is what you see in the green here. So the amount of stretching depends on this distance y. And um, we're going to define the centroidal radius as if I have the inner radius is A and the outer is B. So it's the average value is a centroidal radius, which will be somewhere here. Uh, and also, we can define the eccentricity as the difference between the centroidal radius and the neutral axis. So capital R, loc the location of the neutral axis. So if I have this, the amount of stretch is epsilon theta. And epsilon theta is delta L over L. And in this case, I have delta L is uh, uh, going to be uh, equated to uh, the distance away from the neutral axis, which is y times delta theta. Let me take this delta theta here. And L itself is r, r theta. So if we divide by r theta, uh, so going back to this figure, this is the red is r theta, and the little green that you see is y times uh, d theta. So uh, going back here, uh, you get y times delta theta divided by r theta, and then the stress is equal to e times epsilon theta. So this is e, and this is epsilon theta. So let's change this to r theta and, r and delta theta. Therefore, you get like a constant. You can take the e and uh, the delta theta over theta, and you lump them together. You, get, you call them a constant. And then basically, you have a constant times y over r. This is the, the stress will, will be uh, given by that, where the stress is linear in the distance from the centroid away. So as we move away from the centroid, of course, the stress will be higher. As we know from beam theory, it will be compressive on one side and tensile on one and another side, depending on the sign of y. But the interesting thing here is that you have one over r dependence as well, which was absent in the case of uh, the Euler Bernoulli beam. So if we take that, uh, we can derive the equations that are necessary for us to understand this, uh, this arch. So I'm going back here to say how we can derive the equations. We, will, we have two uh, constants that are unknown, the K and the capital R. The capital R is the uh, uh, location of the neutral axis. And uh, we can actually uh, take two equations. And these two equations, one of them is uh, force equilibrium. And the other one is moment equilibrium. And uh, we will obtain uh, the solution. So the force equilibrium is the first set of equations here. So this is a total force, axial force equal to 0. And then we substitute sigma m and solve for r and r is now a over integral of uh, dA over r, over lowercase r uh, and uh, when we do the solution for the case of a uh, rectangular cross section this is the formula to, that we get for uh, the neutral axis on the other hand if we do moment equilibrium and uh, this is the moment equilibrium the applied moment and this is the internal moment. This is uh, 4 sigma theta times dA. This is the arm length, which is capital R minus lowercase r. So we substitute capital R in here because we solved it from the first equation. And um, from that, we uh, find that the uh, axial, the stress due to the bending is m times y over lowercase r times area times e. So e is eccentricity, which is capital, which is the difference between the centroidal radius and the radius to the neutral axis. And lowercase r is any position defined on the arch. And y is the difference between 
the neutral axis radius and the radius defines any particular fiber. So that's basically what we have here. So I'm going to explain again on this uh, clearer uh, picture. This is your Y, this is the fiber. And the fiber is when you apply a moment, then this fiber uh, stretches a little bit and uh, stretches by, they call it D phi, and this is phi, we call it theta, it's the same thing. And then we define the distance from the neutral axis to the uh, lower surface as C inner, distance to the outer surface as C outer. And uh, in here we use R, lowercase r sub n, uh, to define the location of the neutral axis. And R sub C is the actual location of the centroidal uh, axis, and the difference between them is the eccentricity. Y remains the same. So in this case, all of these definitions are right here. Then uh, the formulas that we developed, this is a formula that determines the um, value of the uh, location of the neutral axis, A divided by integral of dA over R, so it's an area integral. And um, then the stress distribution is, uh, as we said, my, and uh, in the past, when we have like a simple Euler-Bernoulli straight beam, we used to say my over i. But here is my divided by the area times eccentricity times the difference between the location of the neutral axis and the location of the fiber measured from the neutral axis. So in the, when you go to the inner surface, y becomes ci. Rn minus y becomes Ri. When you go to the outer surface, y becomes minus C outer, and then Rn minus R minus y becomes R outer. So equation 364 and 65 is what we could use to describe the stress distribution. So now we are going to take an example, and this example on uh, beam bending we're going to analyze the stresses uh, in a loaded hook using uh, the equations that we developed for uh, bending of a curved beam. So if you, let's look at this example. I have um, a section AA of a crane hook and the cross section is rectangular and we are given the B is 0.75 and the, uh, the H is four inches and uh, we look looking at any particular position R, describe, this is the center, and then we're describing the distance of the fiber from the center by lowercase r, the fiber from the neutral axis by y. So y plus r, lowercase r is always r sub n. <clears throat> and then r sub n deviates from r sub c by the eccentricity e. So here we have uh, the, um, distance from the outside surface to the center at six inches. So now if we apply a force, then this force here is going to cause an axial force here. So let's not uh, look at it now. And it will call also cause a moment. And that's what we're interested in. Just the effect of the of that applied force, which is 5,000 pounds on the stresses induced by the moment. First step is calculate the um, neutral axis location. The area is just B times H. DA is, uh, this is DA is this black strip. And the black strip is B, which is, uh, B is like here. And then times the width of this black strip, which is DR, so B times DR. And then when you do that, then you get a logarithm <coughs> of the outer minus the inner. Substituting values, we get 3.641, which means that is not exactly in the center. Like R sub C is the difference between 6 and 4, like somewhere in the middle. So R sub C is uh, uh, the, uh, the inner radius is 4 and the outer is 6. So midway 
it will be 8 over 2, so R sub C should be 4. You can see here that R sub N is 3.641, so it's a, the eccentricity is 4 minus 3.6, uh, so there is a significant eccentricity. And uh, when we calculate the forces, the total uh, stress, <coughs> we get the axial component, which is 5,000 over the cross-section. Cross-sectional area is this cross-sectional area here. So 4 times 0.75 is equal to 3. And then my over ae times rn minus y. And here we plot everything as a function of either y or r. So the difference is that uh, y is equal to rn minus r. So rn minus so you can choose either you can plot it as a function of lowercase r or as a function of y. Here, plot it as a function of lowercase r, and r varies from 2 to 6, so we get this kind of distribution. And as you can see, <coughs> the, uh, the, uh, uh, the hook, uh, or the arch in this case, it carries more stress on the inside uh, than on the outside surface. So the inside surface is highly stressed on the tension, and the outside surface is slightly stressed on the compression, and the distribution as a function of R is not symmetric as we're used to in the case of uh, the straight beams that we're talking about. So in general, the cross-section, if it is rectangular, then we could use these two formulas for R, R sub C and R sub N. Other shapes are possible. We have all of these formulas in table 3.4. In particular, if we have a, a, a round cross-section, the R sub C is R sub I plus capital R, and the R sub N is given by uh, this expression. So as you can see now, we have all the tools that will uh, enable us to design either a rotating ring or a press fit or even a curved beam or an arch. And with that, we will conclude